Well, I am very excited to be here with all of you. Thank you for your patience during that little funness. Um, in true doctor form, I'm going to be mostly looking at my computer, but as a doctor who tries to be a humanist, I'll try to look up once in a while as well, okay? <laughs> okay. So today I'm going to be talking with you about um, the evolution of Zion. And uh, so the word itself comes from the Hebrew Zion and refers to the ancient mount where David built the city of Jerusalem and Solomon later built the first temple. It has taken on deeper meanings through thousands of years to mean the Holy Land in its entirety or the Holy of Holies in Kabbalistic tradition. And in the national hymn of the Jewish state of Israel, Hatikva, or the hope, we can hear the soulful longing of the exiled Jew for Zion. Oh, sure. The hymn helped to inspire the Zionist movement of the late 1800s and after the atrocities committed against Jews in Europe during World War II, the movement achieved its goal of repatriation in Palestine via the newly formed United Nations. The history of the region since that controversial action of the international community of cutting up Palestine has been marred by much bloodshed and instability. Jews, Christians, Muslims, the Rastafari movement, and Mormons all reverence the idea of Zion and claim hermeneutical privilege in its true meaning. And here in our own backyard, we have another place called Zion that my family and I had the opportunity to visit last week. And this is a view <clears throat> of the Virgin River looking out from the famous Lot Canyon, the Narrows. So for Mormons, the story of Zion, uh, the plot thickens a little bit to include the mystical figure Enoch, who we've already heard about a little bit today. Uh, from these verses listed here from the Bible, the Apocrypha, we gain little insight about Enoch, except that he was exceptionally righteous and he did not die, but was taken up into heaven to walk with God. The story was known in fragments to medieval Western Christendom, and it certainly informed Milton's Paradise Lost, but it was wholly rediscovered in Ethiopian script in the late 18th century and translated into English in 1821. And the works are attributed to Enoch uh, and speak of his ascent into heaven, receiving the history of creation, including the war in heaven uh, and the fall of the Watchers, a group of archangels who intermarried with humans, creating a angel-human hybrid giant race called the Nephilim. The work strongly influenced Kabbalistic angelology and probably inspired large portions of the Book of Moses and the Price writings of Joseph Smith. So in these writings, we are told not just about the apotheosis of Enoch, but also an entire paradisiacal or utopian city that was transfigured. And we are given this beautiful, inspiring passage. And the Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind, and they dwelt in righteousness, and there were no poor among them. To begin to grasp how this verse tapped into the utopian zeitgeist of Smith's audience and inspired generations of Mormon pioneers to cross oceans and plains to build the kingdom of God on the earth, we will first really broadly review the history of Zion utopia in scripture, myth, literature, historical experiments, mostly terrible failures, <laughs> and the Mormon experience. And then we will look at how new philosophical ideas new technologies and transhumanist ethics inform a modern revitalization of this ancient ideal. So my question is, how did the city of Enoch come to be without poverty? Didn't Jesus say, the poor you shall always have with you? So here's my first big idea that I'd like to share with you, and that is that poverty is tantamount to the fall, that poverty is a part of the fallen condition of humanity, and that it uh, it, it rose as a result of agriculture and urbanization. Um, I, I, and I don't have time to get into it right now. That's in my paper. <laughs> so I'd, I'll, I'll post that so you guys can read that. But I would propose that the rise of agriculture in cities represents the greatest punctuation in human existence and gave rise to poverty and other conditions that we asso associate with a fallen state. So many creation myths include original idyllic states that were corrupted by evil and provide a path to reclaim innocence and communion with the divine. Accounts of blessed peacetime in the Bible include the Garden of Eden from Genesis, a brief time of communal peace among the early Christians in Acts chapters two through four, and the millennium after the second coming and the binding of Satan in Revelations chapters 20 through 21. And this is Hieronymus's Garden of Earthy, Earthly Delights in three parts.
In addition to the city of Enoch uh, in Mormon scripture, we have the third and fourth Nephi accounts in the Book of Mormon where we're told of 200 years of peace um, and prosperity that followed the catastrophic natural disasters and the visitation of Jesus. These chapters tell of a perfect communal society uh, and summarize by stating, surely there could not be a happier people among all the people who had been created by the hand of God. Also prominent in these chapters is the tale of the three Nephites, uh, who, like Enoch and John, were not to taste death, but remained behind to minister. And I think this points to a really interesting uh, convergence where the promise of immortality is sort of inex inextricably linked to the promise of a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem and Zion. So I'm going to very briefly now kind of fly through uh, the history of utopia in literature and philosophy. And we're going to go through Plato's Republic, which is, uh, lays out the um, Socrates' vision for a perfect society, which he was kind of just you know, casually talking about after dinner with other Athenian nobles. And then we, <laughs> and then we have uh, Aristotle's contribution, um, his politics and poetics. Later on, St. Augustine with the City of God. I mean, these works tried to marry kind of literature and law in imaginations about how to create a better society, both secular and holy. And then we have, much later on, the uh, tale of King Arthur's Camelot, which uh, married you know, more romantic views about honor, justice, virtue, and equality. And then Dante uh, in his Divine Comedy, uh, which follows the pilgrim through hell, purgatory, and paradise, meshing pagan mythology and Christianity in this sort of epic ballad. And then Thomas More wrote Utopia. So Utopia was written in 1516. It was inspired by Amerigo Vespucci's accounts of the New World and based loosely on the lost continent of Atlantis. More extolled ideas of the Renaissance, humanism, a nostalgia for the classical world, showing them flourishing in his good place, which is what Utopia means. And by resurrecting this ancient longing for an ideal society, More softly inspired and continues to inspire dreamers and innovators alike for the next 500 years. So I'm going to kind of fly through this one. I had a lot of text, but I'm not going to have time to go through it. So uh, following Moore and King Henry VIII, his patron turned executioner, Martin Luther, John Calvin, we have the Reformation spreading across Europe. We have the beginnings of the Enlightenment with continental um, people like Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza. And then you have the English empiricists, John Locke, Francis Bacon, Sir Isaac Newton, laying the framework for modern science, and a great um, rise in the faith of the human ability to understand natural law. And it was born from this enlightenment that we have uh, during the, the colonization of the New World and the discovery of Aboriginal peoples and how that challenged Christianity. We have the first writings about the natural um, order of humans, what our natural existence, our natural state, um, talk, first talking about the social contract. And in this kind of milieu, you have the birth of our own nation um, and the writers of our constitution who explicitly stated that their purpose was to form a more perfect union. So in this atmosphere of limitless possibility and westward expansion of Europeans in the new world, uh, we have the first intentional societies that emerged. And they dotted the countryside, all the way from upstate New York to northern Pennsylvania and Ohio. And these consisted of both religious and secular groups who really wanted to try living in a different way. And they experimented with all kinds of different economics and marital mores and child rearing. And uh, so this is kind of the, the, what's going on in the world at the time that Joseph Smith and his family come down from Vermont um, after that failed harvest in 1816, the year without a summer, as economic refugees to Palmyra. And Palmyra, as we all know, part of the burned over district of the Second Great Awakening, um, this family of Methodist and Unitarian roots quickly found itself caught up in and divided by this revival. So we are all familiar, I think, with the story of Joseph Smith, his visions, his prayerful search for the truth, the founding of the church, its successful missionary efforts in Europe, and the new scripture that came through his revelation, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price. And we're familiar as well with the successive attempts to establish a self-contained, sustainable theocracy. Um, multiple attempts includes multiple fa failures, as we know. Uh, first in Kirtland, Ohio, and then in Jackson County, Missouri, which was explicitly called Zion and the site of the New Jerusalem during the millennium. 
and then again in Nauvoo, Illinois. Um, and it was during this time, actually beginning in the Kirtland period, that Joseph Smith begin, began to receive revelations about what we refer to as the United Order of Enoch, um, this new way of living that is based on the uh, kind of communal attitude of the early Christians who had all things in common. We see that phrase pop up again and again in these writings and these revelations. So part of this system, as we know, was polygamy, uh, the consequences of which led to Smith's violent death. Um, but also included in this system, is a, a, which is contained in the law of consecration, is a, a system of kind of being assigned a stewardship and then returning the excess of your labor to a central storehouse that can be distributed to the needy. Um, something we call the law of consecration discussed in Doctrine and Covenants, um, chapter 42. For some reason it's not advancing. Okay, let me try this one more time. Any ideas? And just a commentary while we're waiting. I love this image. It has so many throwbacks to like USSR with the, the scythe and the pe I love that. It's so communist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, yeah, there we go. So this is kind of a schematic of the law of consecration. Let's see if it'll work now. Uh, what'd you do? How can I repeat it? There we go, okay. So now let's talk about, um, so these early experiments in communal living while under the, in the lifetime of Joseph Smith were l largely short-lived. Even though it was a prerequisite at first for membership, um, it, they quickly kind of fell apart for a variety of reasons. And we didn't really see this, um, the era of the order really reach its peak until during the time of Brigham Young, uh, Smith's successor here in the Ender Mountain West, um, when a bunch of these new voluntary communities, no longer requisite, were established throughout the Wasatch Front, throughout the frontier. Um, and some of the notable examples of these uh, efforts were the Zions Collective Mercantile Institute, uh, Brigham City, which operated a stock exchange company system, and Orderville, my favorite. So Orderville was something really, truly unique. Um, Orderville, where a, where a lack of morale and a sort of willingness to adopt a communal system kind of had doomed previous experiments, Orderville had these qualities in spades. Um, they even took Smith's vision further. They adopted uniform clothing, uniform living arrangements, uh, a, a committee which oversaw everything from work to recreation. Um, and they were very successful um, and eventually were kind of pressured. It was external pressures which led to their demise. External pressures from both the federal government and the Edmonds Anti-Polygamy Act as well as the Central Church Authority which kind of told them to to disband uh, in an effort to reintegrate into mainstream American society after the manifesto. So the vision, though, of Joseph Smith to establish Zion in the New World is a strong motivator for, was a strong motivator for early converts and continues to be a strong motivator for multi-generational Mormons um, whose ancestors participated in these experiments like myself. So if I can bring it up, I have a really cool picture here of the, the people of Orderville. And then if one more slide, one, one more click. Those are my great fourth great grandparents, um, Isaac von Wagner Carling and his sweetheart, Azeneth Elizabeth Browning of Browning Machine Gun fame, um, her, his daughter, um, or sister, I can't remember which. So, you know, I, I am continued, continually inspired by their legacy, by, what, by the, the yearning that they experienced. And I think it's very interesting that at the dawn of the 20th century, um, as Mormons were stepping back from trying to create a physical, peculiar utopia, the secular world was kind of coming into its own, was maturing and, and thought that it could flex its muscles and try to corner the market on societal perfection. And we were part of that, you know, for the, the next century. Okay, go ahead. And this one has a lot of um, pictures, so we'll just go through them really quickly. So um, I'm gonna move on now to the science and humanism and how, kind of the follies that came along with that are ups and downs. So the scientific revolution inspired people, um, renewed a hope for a humanistic future. Go ahead. Um, 
you know, and we had the first wide-scale rejection of large-scale um, inequality, leading Karl Marx in 1848 to call for workers of the world to unite. Go ahead. Um, and his philosophy of materialism and communism came to rule a third of the world's population in its heyday. Nothing to shake your nose at. Go ahead. Um, then, you know, also in the middle of the 19th century, we had Charles Darwin and his synthesis, um, inspired by Malthus on population, of his the theory of natural selection. Go ahead. Um, and this it was at this point that atheism really became a force to be reckoned with. Um, we had the Geneva Circle, the logical positivists, who kind of found their voice after Darwin and his theories. For better or worse, he's kind of linked to atheism and the, some of the follies of, of the next century. Go ahead. We have the demise of the old world order in World War I, uh, the rise of German romanticism together with nihilism, and a, a false understanding of Darwin's views, uh, which led to the movement of eugenics. Um, and these things combined in a perfect storm to give us fascism. Um, and go ahead. And uh, you know, because of the, the atrocities of World War II, the US finally stepped in, uh, invading. Um, and our military and political victories over fascism, go ahead, and again over communism later, um, have kind of introduced and maintained the current status quo, the current global monoculture, which continues to steamroll by globalization and often by coercion. Go ahead. All right, next. So I'd like to, I think one of the best things that has happened in Western culture in the last 50 years is we really have stepped back from this kind of illusion that progress is always linear. And we have reflected on our folly and some of the things we have really, really gotten wrong. And um, one of the things that we really, really got wrong was how we treated the indigenous people of these continents. Um, at first, we were fascinated by the savages and we wanted to civilize them, but that quickly devolved into, because of our insatiable desire for wealth and land, into their genocidal slaughter um, and imprisonment, go ahead, in reservations. Um, you put this right next uh, to the brutal enslavement of millions of West Africans um, and post hoc religious and pseudoscientific justifications for this. Um, so these kinds of atrocities were, have been committed and continue to be committed by European powers because of this sort of false sense of technological and cultural evolution superiority due to some imagined uh, biological or even divinely endowed selection. Go ahead. So it's no surprise that most modern Westerners have become very skeptical of utopian ideologies, preferring instead the counter genre of dystopias, which were born in the early 20th century with classics such as Huxley's Brave New World and George Orwell's 1984. Go ahead. Um, so the atrocities of totalitarianism and dictatorships, numerous, too numerous to mention, um, as well as post-secular and post-religious utopianism, um, these, these failures are not limited to the West or traditional Christian societies. We also have seen recently the resurgence since the, the the state of Iran, for example, or the modern movements of the Taliban in Afghanistan and Pakistan, as well as ISIS. Um, so go ahead and advance a couple. So the Taliban and ISIS. Go ahead. So next big question. Why the draw? <laughs> why, do, why do we still feel compelled to follow these utopian ideologies after such terrible failures, such an abysmal track record? Go ahead. And I posit that it's because with every success and failure, the world has adapted, learned, and evolved. Go ahead. So we must ask ourselves, or we may ask ourselves, is there an arc to history? And if so, does it truly bend toward justice? Um, experiments and other primates demonstrate that reciprocal altruism, indignation, a sense of justice, do appear to have biological basis. Go ahead. Um, the study of biological evolution has yielded clear patterns um, and can be predicted. Go ahead. And that accepting the fast and loose term of evolution to also mean emergence of our future society by a system of artificial selection and pressure, I propose that we have a responsibility to influence our evolution according to our values and preserve human rights and the environment. And we should not wait for this to happen naturally or by some external act of God. 
I don't think I'm alone here <laughs> feeling that way. Um, so I'm going to go really quickly now through the rest of this because this is where the meat is and I know I'm almost out of time. Um, so the topic of my, my talk today, the evolution of Zion, I'm going to here give a little hat tip to Nathaniel Gibbons, so I'm not sure if he's here today, but yes, last year he gave a great talk on Zion as superorganism, and superorganisms evolve too. <laughs> go ahead. Um, so there is no pinnacle of evolution for us to sit upon. Um, we, must, we hairless apes must content ourselves with our branch. But that does not preclude an underlying selective pressure for flourishing beyond mere stability and survival. Um, go ahead. Pictured here are, um, a, well, go ahead, one more, are an ancient and a more modern phylogenetic tree of life. Um, go ahead, one more click. The arrow demonstrates our position on the tree of life. Like I said, no pinnacle, just a branch. And then on the right um, is the Kabbalistic tree of life, which is a network of emanations or attributes of God that are believed to underlie physical reality. This was a medieval and mystical exploration of interconnection and emergence. Go ahead. So while it may be reductionist to assume that social and technological evolution yield themselves to similar prescience and control over biological evolution, it is possible that the needed advances in our understanding and the tools necessary to monitor and influence these complex systems represent a difference of degree and not necessarily a difference of kind. Go ahead. And in scientific terms, that, is, that can be stated in terms of a Popperian or a puzzle-solving paradigm versus a Cunian or a paradigm shift um, paradigm with independent um, cyclical kinds of huge leaps forward in the thinking. Go ahead. So an analogous paradigm duality can be seen in phylogenetics and cladistics. Um, go ahead with gradual evolution as shown here on the top versus a more, more recent and better studied um, kind of evolution or speciation called punctuated equilibrium. We know that punctuate, punctuated equilibrium happens, um, but we have also seen evidence of gradualism happen as well in different speciation events. And the real how new species evolve is probably some combination of both. Go ahead. So such small evolutionary steps must confer uh, in order to be propagated. They must have selective advantage. Each new mutation must have some advantage in order to be carried forward. That's a, a very key part of evolution. And I, I am proposing that with each step, we have to carry with us as part of both a cost and a benefit, um, respect for universal human rights, the rights of our moral subjects, and the rights of non-human conscious things. And then we have to recognize too that those rights will evolve over time because rights are a human construct. Go ahead. So evolving into Zion will, will change the way we live, right? And so changing the way we live involves new economic and legal systems which are based on ecological impact and a decentralized authority made possible via the internet. Please click. Um, and such, and pre, there are previous iterations that have tried to do this, um, libertarian socialism and the arcology movement of Paulo Soleri, which is pictured here, Arcosanti, an experimental community in the desert of Arizona, which I've visited a couple times. But these previous iterations have fallen prey to scarcity-based economic pressures because they didn't have access to the types of technology that are coming online and getting cheaper all the time. Next. Um, so some other proposed small examples in our cultural evolution include um, seasteading, Mazdar City in the United Arab Emirates, go ahead, um, and the United Arab Emirates recently released proposal for the first human settlement on Mars. And then we have other big long shot programs, go ahead, such as generational ships like the Nauvoo. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are watching The Expanse? I love it. And then we have large scale um, terraforming projects here in our own solar system, like the terraforming of Mars. Um, some tools that are coming online uh, that are going to make this possible are, are those listed here, fusion reactors, desalination and atmospheric water collectors, 3D printers and von Neumann type machines, CRISPR, M drive, and so many other things that we can't even imagine right now. Go ahead. So I think part of the economic portion of the evolution is going to be understanding that Adam Smith's invisible hand that guides markets is not a, you know, it's not invisible and it's not a mystery. It is a, it's a connection, it's a network of supercomputers that are contained right here in our skulls. It's the supercomputer of everyone involved in a free market. And previous attempts to, uh, to establish a centralized economic planning authority have failed because they did not have access to the, the, the needed computational power. And during the uh, technological singularity, we will, have that tech, we will have that computational power and so much more to spare. Go ahead. The emergence of blockchain um, 
and other kinds of technologies is going to make this possible. It's going to shed light on income inequality, um, and it's going to increase enfranchisement and power in a democratic fashion. Go ahead. Um, so reducing inequality happens in one of two ways. We can either tax or we can rely on philanthropy, and it really doesn't matter. Both ways lead to positive outcomes. We've seen good examples of both. And um, e even in the Nordic states, which have long been bastions of liberal democratic socialism, they're even now toying with the idea of a guaranteed universal income. Go ahead. So with scarcity for resources never going away, but our paradigm and the way that we ration things can change over time. Go ahead, let's just go through all of these real quickly. As our population ages and becomes um, birth control and education are gonna swell the middle class, which is gonna put enormous pressure on our current system, leading to scarcity and shortages right at the time that human population is peaking and reaching its most drastic levels. And hopefully, we will see the emergence of some of these, these technologies come online in time to prevent Malthusian-type collapse from pressures that are very real and are very much knocking on our doorsteps, such as climate change. Um, with science, we may be able to help prevent these terrible catastrophes by increasing our understanding of the biology of human empathy. Go ahead. And creation of immersive simulations of another subjective experience, something I like to call atonement technology um, I, as, a, as a form of education and enlightenment. It's a, it, a, an experience that could really drastically change another person. Go ahead. Most neuroscientists agree that human free will is either non-existent or very, very limited, but they also agree that keeping that notion alive is useful. It increases pro-social and moral behavior if we believe that we are free. And so we have, to learn, we have to know more about this. We have to learn the biology of human anatomy, and we have to be able to create enhancements that will make pro-social and good choices easier. And I don't think that this will take away our freedom to choose to be antisocial. The way I envision it working, go ahead, is more like a catalyst. It's going to reduce the starting energy necessary to move the reaction in the desired direction. It's gonna make being better easier. Go ahead. And such enhancements, go ahead, from um, an enlightenment would be highly, highly effective within a religious context. And they point to an avenue for those more um, ready religions who want to adopt and adapt to these changes to become leaders. Go ahead. Um, but a word of caution to exclusive or universal types of religions that think they have the one and only way and imagine a future of their own dominance. I would say that the future they envision is unsafe for everyone, including themselves. Go ahead. We have to instead reject monolithic cultures and ideals and instead embrace a more of a, a grand um, accepting very diverse community that is involved in a non-zero-sum game of infinite complexity. And we have to hold that as our standard. That is Zion. That is, go ahead, the one healed whole body and mind of humanity. Go ahead. And I thank you very much for your patience. And all right, hold my, let's go.